just want you to know that today we are beginning a series of messages that are going to take us through the entire month of August. And the series is entitled, Are You in Need of a Faith Lift? Not a face lift, but a faith lift. And today we're going to be looking at this thought, when our faith falters. Our scripture is taken from Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. And I believe in your bulletin, you have a sermon outline. The scripture is there. You can follow along as I share it with you. You can fill in the blanks in the outline if you'd like to do so, or just listen and let God speak to your heart, whatever is your preference. Mark 9, verses 14 through 29. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who possessed by a spirit that's robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsions. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has it been like this? From childhood, he answered, it is often thrown into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You dead and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out from him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, This kind can come out only by prayer. Let me just share, if you're filling in notes or just by the way of listening, the very thrust of this series is to move all of us, myself included, from a faith that falters to a faith that becomes functional, a functioning faith, a faith that is active, a faith in which God can honor, a faith which God can use. You know, the biggest lesson I've learned over this past year, for some of you know that I turned 60 last Sunday, so I should get your copy with a walker and a cane. But anyhow, what I've learned over this past year is the fact that I have so much yet to learn. And especially in regard to this area of faith. How many would dare raise your hand and confess like me that there are times we Easy. all need a faith lift? Easy. Amen. In our passage, we find a man whose son is plagued by a demon. And some of Jesus' disciples were attempting to cast out the demon of the boy, but they could not. They failed in their attempt. So almost out of desperation, the father of the boy takes him to Jesus. And the man asked Jesus to help his son if he could. Now we're going to come back to that because that's a key question. The man says, if you can, would you do this for me? But we'll come back to that in a few moments. Jesus, however, is a very strong response. He says, anything is possible if a person believes. Now, let me put a, a little qualifier to that. As Jesus is speaking, he's talking about things possible in the realm of God's will. If you're walking outside of God's will, don't expect God to bless you. If you're wanting things to consume it upon yourself, don't expect God to go ahead and answer those kinds of prayers. But if you're praying within the will of God, you 
you're seeking the heart of God, all things then are possible for those who put their confidence and trust in him. The man replied after Jesus spoke these words with an expression that I believe could be uttered by virtually every Christian at one point or another. He says, I do believe, but help me not to doubt. Other translations say, help me in my unbelief. There's no doubt in my mind that there are those of us in this room who believe wholeheartedly in Jesus Christ. We believe in God's word, that it has power, it's God's authority. It is spoken and it is true. We believe in miracles. Pastor Judy shared about John Welch in the full recovery that's happening to him, and that is nothing shy of a miracle of God. We believe in all these things, but aren't there still times in our Christian walk when our faith falters? Aren't there times in our walk when God asks us to do something, and what he asks us to do appears too large for us to handle. Or he's taking us through a life situation, maybe a life experience that's too daunting for our minds to comprehend. And so looking at the task, or looking at the situation, and then looking in the mirror, and seeing ourselves, we're like, God, do you know what you're doing? God, are you sure I'm the right person for this? God, do you really, really consider who I am and what you're asking? So doubt starts to settle in. And for some of us, it may just flat out be unbelief. You know, at this point in my life, and I, and I say this humbly, but at this point, I'm probably pursuing God more than I ever have. I'm trying to walk closer to Him. I think when you reach a certain age, some things become far more important than others. There's some things you just let go by because it doesn't mean that much anymore. But there's other things you really want to hold on to because you know life is of the essence and time is short. But here's my confession. The closer I get to God, the more I see my own spiritual shortcomings. The more that God sheds his light on my life, ouch, the more it hurts the more I see myself for who I really am. And I'm sure there's times within my heart, if I've never said it verbally, I've cried out, God, I want to believe. I need to believe. But help me in the <coughs> moment of doubt. God called me to be the pastor of Church Mike Wesley in church. Oh, if you really knew me, you'd probably be looking for somebody else. You'd probably be firing me on the spot and looking at some job applications from others who are far more qualified in a host of areas. I say, God, why? Why do you call me? You know, my, my wife says that if my IQ is about 10 points higher, I'd be perfect. <laughs> perfect idiot. Which I haven't reached the idiot stage yet. This is a situation I battle. And yet, God still is there, and it's God who undergirds. It's God who gives the strength. It's God who makes all things possible. I am absolutely fascinated by the statement this man made to Jesus. Whether he knew Jesus intimately or not, the Bible does not say. Yet he managed, and again, I'm giving you my reflection. He managed to summarize in one sentence what is probably one of the greatest obstacles to spiritual growth in the Christian life, and that is a faltering faith. You see, the man was saying, in essence, although he believed in what Jesus was able to do, but he really wasn't sure if Jesus would come through. He was still kind of battling, contending with those feelings of doubts. It almost reminds me of a man, and you've heard the story before, who I don't know what he was doing or why he wasn't paying attention, but he lost his footing and fell over a cliff. However, he was able to grab a branch on his way down and jetted from the rocks. And he's looking down and going, man, his life is not in the balance. And so he's holding onto that branch and he's praying and he says, God, if you're looking up in heaven, I want you to know if you will save me from this, I will surrender my life to you. I'll do whatever you ask. I am yours, totally yours. And believe it or not, the voice from heaven responded, this is the Lord. I want to be your 
your Savior and your Redeemer. I will hear you and answer your prayer. Let go of the wind. So the guy still holds on and says, I'm not so sure you heard my prayer. You know, I, I will do everything for you. I'll surrender my life. I will be all that you want me to be. And again, the voice comes out, this is the Lord. Let go of the wind. A little hesitation. Hey, God, is there anybody else up there I can speak to? <laughs> I believe we're there, right? <laughs> Looking down, seeing what might happen if we let go of the limb. I'm not so sure I could jump into that type of faith. Well, let's go ahead and examine this morning this man's expression. Next week, we're going to come back to this very same text. But we're going to be looking at how to overcome doubt. And today, this is just kind of the foundation where we're setting the stage. The man's expression, I think, has three characteristics to it that I'd like to share with you. The first is, it's an expression of complete honesty. One commentator says this of the text. It expresses the dilemma that even those who believe can be nagged by doubt and hopelessness. This man, in the moment of his doubt and his hopelessness, was honest before God. Saying, Lord, I do believe, but how do you in these areas that I'm struggling in. He was saying, Lord, I do believe in everything you say. I thank you. I do believe in the great power that I hear about and I've witnessed and, and you know, I, I've seen you do. I think I do. believe in all of that. And you and I can sit here if we like and we can criticize this man for not being all he should be. But I'll tell you what, I appreciate this story in Scripture because the man is honest. He came forth before God. In fact, what good would it have done him to claim complete faith and perfect faith if he really didn't have it? God can see all that. God knows our heart. He knows who we are. He knows the strengths and the weaknesses of our faith even as we sit here in this room. And the disciples themselves had to learn over and over again that they weren't as strong in their faith as they pretended to be in the, in the image they wanted to give everybody. In fact, this man's son is a case in point. They tried to drive out the demon, and they couldn't do it. So you and I can talk all day long about how great our faith is in God, that we don't doubt him at all, that uh, we're walking perfectly in his footsteps. But if there truly is doubt in your life, if there are areas where you struggle, then all you're doing is fooling yourself and nobody else. So I think part of what this is here for us is to help us to confess before God and to be honest about our areas of doubt. You know, here's a lesson for us to grasp. Where is it in our own faith walk that we would really let God to strengthen? Just come before and say, God, you know what? This is an area where I know I have difficulties and struggles. It's an area where I truly am asking for a faith lift. What is the greater sin? Faltering in our faith or faking our faith? If you were to ask me, I'd say faking your faith. Because if you're faltering, it means you have faith. You're just struggling in some, some particulars. But if you're faking it, there's really nothing there. Listen, even the best Christians from biblical age to the present time have had issues of doubt. John the Baptist in Matthew 11, verses 1 through 6, had a doubt or a bout with doubt. And Jesus didn't condemn him. In fact, Jesus did what he could to reassure him. And you and I, likewise, as we walk with Jesus Christ, are going to have moments when we have lapses in our faith. And I'm praying that God did moves in and gives us courage and strength. The second thing I notice is an expression of deep concern. As I studied the passage out, I had to ask myself, why did this man, in front of so many other people, maybe even his own family and peers, make such a forthright confession? Just come right out and say, you know, I need to believe better. I think he did it because he was concerned. Let me explain that to you. 
He was concerned for the fact that even though he had faith, would it be enough to heal his son? In other words, God, would you look upon my faith and honor it in such a way that you would touch my son's life? That was his concern. He knew he had a measure of trust for Jesus, but is that measure strong enough to reach beyond him to touch the ones he loves so deeply and so dearly? In fact, this kind of comes out of the original language. The man says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And then Jesus comes right back, if I can. I almost chuckled when I read this because Jesus, to me, was saying, hey, why did you bring him to me if you didn't think I had the ability? What was his whole purpose of you bringing your son, telling me his whole life story, the problems that he's facing, the healing that he needs, and then say, I don't know if you can really do anything, Jesus. Well, you know, asterisks. If you can, would you step in? That's what Jesus is trying to say. Listen, your faith Needs to be thrown upon God Himself. As we use the expression, let go and let God. And Jesus was saying to this man, if you just simply believe, put your doubts aside, all things are possible. I can't help but think that perhaps Jesus is saying the same to us here in this room. If we would just trust Him, doubts aside, all things are possible. Our prayers are always heard, but Jesus is wanting to respond in a way that will bless our lives beyond our wildest imagination. Can you think of times when your faith did always rise to the occasion? Have you discovered there have been moments there have been some chinks in the armor of your faith? Are there some areas in your life where you still haven't done what God's asked you to do, or you haven't walked in a way in which God has called upon you to walk? George Mueller made this statement. God would like to increase the faith of his children. I say, and I say it deliberately, trials, difficulties, and sometimes defeat are the very food of faith. We should accept them from out of his hands as evidence of his love and care for us in developing more and more the faith which he is seeking to strengthen in us. Powerful statement. And then finally, it's an expression of sincere desire. The man came to Jesus with a son that had some real issues. I believe he came in tears. I believe he cried out to Jesus, I, I believe, please help me in my unbelief. This man was at a point of desperation. The term that we use today, he was at his wit's end. The disciples couldn't do anything about it. The medical profession couldn't do anything about it. He as a dad couldn't do anything about it. He ran to the point where there was no other way but Jesus. There's probably no feeling of intense desperation, and I, and I say this even with tears in my heart, intense desperation when you as a parent cannot even help your own child. Have you ever been there before? Sometimes it's over sickness. I can't tell you the times Penny and I have prayed, and sometimes <coughs> all through the night when one of our kids, as we were raising them, was running or spiking a high temperature. The doctors didn't know what to do, we didn't know what to do, but we knew God was the hope. And we just prayed through the night, but we just feel hopeless as a parent. And there's even times now my wife and pray, and I, I should say, pray over our adult children. Uh, we sometimes make poor decisions, and we grieve over some of the things they do. But it's an awful feeling to be helpless, especially when it comes to your children or your grandchildren. I share that because I want you to imagine how this father had to have felt. He comes with his son. And I would encourage you to read back over this text sometime through the week to understand what that son was encountering. It says that he was 
being burned, he was thrown into fire, he was cutting himself, he was foaming at the mouth like a rabid animal. I mean, all kinds of things this son is going through from childhood right up to this point. Listen, when you and I are desperate, then the truth really comes out. And what I mean by that, it's so easy to sit in a church setting where life is going well and cry out, oh, Lord, I have great faith in you. It's so easy to put our faith on display when life hasn't thrown us a curveball. But when tragedy hits and there's heartache or trials come our way, then comes the real evidence of where our faith stands. But here's the good news. When we face up the faltering faith, when we simply just admit it, God, this is an area you really need to help me in, it gives God, do, gives God room to do what only God can do. I, I love this story because when the man came to Jesus and it finally was revealed his faith wasn't strong enough, did you notice that Jesus did not say to the man, well, you know what? Come back tomorrow, meet the same time, same place, same station, and uh, if your faith is better, you know, bring your son along and, and I'll heal him. Or he didn't say, hey, why don't you run to the temple and there buy a handkerchief, then come running all the way back and I'll bless that handkerchief, and then you can go home and that handkerchief will heal your child. Jesus said anything that, did What did Jesus do? Healed the child. He simply killed the child right there in front of everybody. Well, I'm going to ask the praise team if they would come back to the platform at this time. <laughs> you know, if we're going to grow in Christ Jesus, and especially grow in this faith issue, the best thing we possibly can do is stand before the Lord and really say from the bottom of our hearts, I believe you, Lord, but please help me. Help me in my moments of unbelief. Let me remind you again of the applicant and palate. Do you know that this animal is only three and a half feet tall? And yet it can jump straight up nine feet. It cannot be barricaded. It can jump over, uh, could be the walls of the pilot, nine feet. But it literally can run and leap tall objects with a single bottle. It's like a Superman animal. However, if you capture an African impala, you can imprison it with just a four-foot wall, but the wall has to be solid. Because an African impala will never jump where it cannot see where his feet will not land. And so if it can't see through a wall, can't see what's on the other side, it will never leap. It will never jump. I'm wondering. Is our faith like that? Are we unwilling to really jump into the arms of God's grace? Are we unwilling to jump when God says, well, you just trust me. Let go of the rage. Let go of the man. If you're battling faith this morning and it's faltering, we encourage you to come to the altars. The praise team leads us in song. We're not going to tarry long, but I believe that through this series, God's going to help all of us, myself included, with this thing called a faith rib. If our faith is faltering, God's here to meet and to strengthen you. Next Sunday, how to overcome our doubts. Let's stand together.